Vale. Um, Linda Vale is the health officer for the Ingham County Health Department. In addition to leading the Ingham County's COVID response, Linda oversees a department with almost 400 employees and a $52 million budget and a network of eight health centers. The department provides health care to county jail inmates, oversees medical examiner duties through a contract with Sparrow Health handles restaurant inspections, well water screening, infant and maternal health programs, wrenching programs, and disease control. A lot. Um, in 2018, Linda signed into effect the department's first ever health equity policy to formalize practices and procedures of the department related to health equity and social justice, and has been involved in efforts to assess and expand the department's capacity to advance health equity and social justice. Linda also serves as a community instructor for the WMU School of Medicine Department of Family and Community Medicine. And she previously worked as a part-time faculty member in the department where she provided classroom instruction for undergraduates in health policy analysis. Prior to her role at the Ingham County Health Department, Linda was the director of the Kalamazoo County Health and Community Services Department, where she led strategic leadership management and overall performance of a consolidated human service agency, including public health programs, area agency on aging, community action agency, and veteran services. Vail is also a trained microbiologist with a background in disease research and worked for nearly 16 years as a research scientist at the Upjohn Company, which later became Pfizer, prior to her move into the public sector. Vail has a Bachelor of Science in Microbiology from the University of Georgia, attended the University of Georgia's Graduate School in Microbiology and earned an MPA from Western Michigan University. We are also joined today by Dr. Joan A. Khaldun. Dr. Khaldun is the Chief Medical Executive for the State of Michigan and Chief Deputy Director for Health in the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services. In these roles, she provides overall medical guidance for the State of Michigan as a cabinet member for the governor, and oversees public health and aging programs, Medicaid and behavioral health for MDHHS. Prior to her MDHHS role, she was the director and health officer for the Detroit Health Department where she oversaw a robust community health assessment, established a comprehensive reproductive health network, spearheaded new human service efforts and led Detroit's response to the largest hepatitis A outbreak in modern US history. In previous roles, Dr. Khaldun was the Baltimore City Health Department's Chief Medical Officer, the Director of the Center for Injury Prevention and Control at George Washington University, Founder and Director of the Fellowship in Health Policy at the University of Maryland Department of Emergency Medicine, and Fellow in the Obama Administration's Office of Health Reform in the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. She currently serves on the National Advisory Board for the Institute of Healthcare Policy and Innovation at the University of Michigan, on the board of directors of Big Brothers and Sisters of Metropolitan Detroit, and on the Health and Medicine Committee of the National Academies of Science, Engineering, and Medicine. She is an adjunct professor in the Department of Health Policy and Management at the U of M School of Public Health. Earlier this month, the Biden administration also topped tapped Dr. Khaldun to join the federal COVID-19 Health Equity Task Force, where she it will help inform the Biden administration's COVID-19 response. Dr. Khaldun obtained her undergraduate degree from the University of Michigan, medical degree from the University of Pennsylvania, MPH in health policy from George Washington University, and completed residency in emergency medicine at SUNY Downstate Medical Center, Kings County Hospital in Brooklyn, New York, where she was elected chief resident in her final year. She still currently practices emergency medicine part-time at Henry Ford Hospital in Detroit, and now I'm gonna pass it over to Bridge Michigan Health reporter, Robin Erb, to get us started. Thanks so much for joining us, everyone, and especially Dr. Khaldun and, and Linda. I know after speaking to you so, so often in this last year, just how busy you are, how many demands there are in your time. So thanks for taking time for, for Bridge readers. One of the things I love about Bridge, and I've been doing I tell everybody I've been a reporter long enough to remember dark rooms and, 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 and developing photos in dark rooms. One of the things I love about Bridge after in this long career um, is, is that Bridge gives us space not only to engage with readers, but to talk to folks that we normally talk to in the, the frenetic pace of deadlines. So again, thank you. We had a lot of we had a lot of questions from readers. 
So let's just get to it. Um, the first one, Dr. Khaldun, this is for you. And, and Linda, of course, please jump in any time. And this goes for both of you in any of these questions, please jump in. But if you could tell us, Dr. Khaldun, to lead us off, give us an overview of, of the vaccine distribution right now in Michigan. And you know, what, part of this is that we hear from readers saying, especially from senior readers saying, I'm still trying to get my vaccine. I can't, and I'm seeing the uh, eligibility expand to other groups. So tell me a little bit about what's happening. Absolutely, and thank you for hosting uh, this event and having me on today. Um, looking forward to the conversation. So um, we're very uh, pleased with the progress we've made in the state of Michigan when it comes to vaccines being administered. Um, I think today we'll be announcing uh, over 2 million uh, doses of vaccine have been administered, so shots in arms across the state since we started this process uh, in mid-December. Um, we know that over 40% of people over the age of 75 have gotten at least one dose of vaccine. Um, and 15%, over 15% of Michiganders over the age of 16 uh, have already gotten at least one dose as well. So we're making progress, um, but there's no question, I certainly wish that everyone who wanted a vaccine uh, could get one today. Uh, our, our biggest challenge has been simply the amount of vaccines available to the state. Uh, so we at the state level, uh, we uh, get information about how much vaccine we'll have available to our state partners. And we receive that information uh, every week. And what we do is basically allocate it out uh, across our various providers in the state. So we started, of course, with uh, healthcare workers and local health departments and our frontline workers in, in nursing homes and people living in our, our long-term care facilities. Uh, as you mentioned, we did expand eligibility in the middle, the middle of January to include uh, people who are over the age of, of 65. I will tell you that even the CDC, before any vaccine was available, we, the CDC actually put out a plan that explained that we knew, even though there are phases, we knew that the phases would overlap and run in parallel. And so what that means is we knew that we would be expanding eligibility for various populations before the previously eligible group would be 100% complete. And unfortunately, what that means is that, yes, there are some people who are eligible in the initial group who may not have gotten a vaccine before we expand eligibility. But it is important for us to get as many people vaccinated as quickly as possible. And so we monitor uh, uh, appointments, um, how quickly people are filling those appointments and getting shots in arms. And as we start seeing that improve across the state, we make decisions to move forward. We expect and actually intend, at least in the short term, while there is limited uh, supply, that the demand will outpace the supply. And unfortunately, that's because we want to get as many people vaccinated as quickly as possible and really make sure our appointment system is, is saturated. Certainly, it's good news that there's plenty of demand for the vaccine. It's the uh, the 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 tight, uh, the, the, the disruptions in the supply channel. And Linda, you, you, if you could talk a little bit about that, um, it's not like you get a predictable supply every week of vaccines, right? Tell me on the ground, how does that work out? Well, I mean, the state is doing a yeoman's job of trying to get there for us, but has also lacked some information and is in the midst of just some very, you know, complicated calculations as well as you know, dealing with some issues that, you know, some of us didn't predict in terms of, you know, some, some health systems that were short, some second doses and things like that. So that'd be a lot of shifting around related to that. And um, so, you know, as of now, we still learn on Friday how much vaccine is arriving um, Monday or Tuesday sometimes. So um, we've been fortunate in this county, we received our first allocation of vaccine on a Thursday. Um, we, so we plan clinics the following Monday. So we usually use the de vaccine that we receive this week for next week's clinics. Um, that way, like the delay that happened with the snow and stuff like that, that hasn't affected us. And it's also allowed us to never have to cancel appointments. Um, so it, it, you know, we continue, actually, we just got a little bit of an increase in supply. We do have a fairly good feeling at this point in time that we'll continue at that pace for at least another two to three weeks before we see that increasing. And like I said, uh, Bob Swanson, who, who works uh, with Dr. Khaldun, really does 
a, a tremendous job and a lot of work on those allocations. It just, it's complicated. And I just wanted to add on to uh, Dr. Caldoun and expanding um, uh, the uh, eligibility groups. We do have to be mindful of the fact that 65 is not the same for everyone. I have a zip code, a census tract in Lansing where lifespan is 67. I have a zip code in Ingham County or a census tract in Ingham County where, where lifespan is 86. So when you've got a 17 year difference in lifespan and you cap off vaccinations at 75, when some people are not predictably even going to live that long, then you've really done an injustice some, to some people. So I think that's part of the reason. You know, let's, let's actually jump from there to one of the questions that, and we've been writing a lot about this, is the whole issue of, of the social vulnerability index and distributing vaccines based on you know, socioeconomic factors and race factors. Um, to both of you, I don't know who wants to jump in first, but tell me a little bit about what these factors, how these factors um, guide the distribution and then as a follow-up, the second part of that is if you could speak to something that just developed in the last you know, 24, 36 hours, which is the, um, the plan adopted by some Republicans to prohibit the use of those socioeconomic factors to distribute the vaccine. So again, how does it play into the distribution and how do you manage um, the pushback from folks who say you shouldn't really use that social vulnerability index? I, I got to start at, at the state level, and, and I'll say the social vulnerability index, it's something that the CDC has used for some time. It actually includes several factors, and it's race and ethnicity is one of, of 15, but it also includes language, it includes disability status, it includes uh, extremes of age in your household, so elderly or very young, uh, it includes language, it includes housing, transportation, and so social vulnerability index, if you actually look across the state, it's not just about urban areas. There are actually several rural areas across the entire state who actually have a very high, the highest percentile when it comes to social vulnerability index. So I do think it's very important that people actually understand that. Uh, and, and I bet if they understood and actually saw the map of social vulnerability index, they might change their minds about uh, how they think about that in the process. So what we do from a state perspective is really look at across all of our areas, um, how the, the number of people who are currently eligible, so over age 65 and the various essential workers that are currently eligible. And then we automatically give every entity vaccines. And then there's just a, a factor, a multiplier factor, if you will, as far as uh, how much additional vaccine uh, each entity would get based on the social vulnerability index. Um, I, I'll also say that I think it's really important when we think about equity, and of course, Linda's also an, an expert in this, as you could tell from, from her bio, it's really not about taking away from anyone. It's about making sure everybody has the same access to the vaccines. Uh, if you are someone who uh, does not have a job or does not have a car, then having your vaccine strategy be about a mass vaccination site that's an hour away, that's not really gonna help you. And so it's really about breaking down barriers to access for those who are the most vulnerable. We want everybody. Um, we want the rich people and the poor people, the people who are dis disabled and those who are not. Everyone should have the ability to get access to the vaccines. And it just means that some people may need a little more help to be able to have access to that, those vaccines. So that's really, really important. I'll also say it's not just about allocation. It's also what people do when they get the vaccine. So that gets into process. So you could have a mass vaccination site, which is very important. And Linda's doing a, a great job with mass vaccination sites. But what Linda's also doing is going into communities and partnering with neighborhoods and community-based organizations um, to be able to get vaccines into those neighborhoods to address some of those barriers I described. Linda, can yeah. you talk a little, I mean, oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, I, I was just saying, if, if we could, you know, and I, I hear about this from the state level, but can you give me an example, just in Ingham County, what is, what is a way that you're reaching out to some of these groups? Is it, I don't know, billboards? Is it phone calls? How, how do you put this into play in real terms? 
Well, um, first of all, it's not billboards right now. Um, you know, I was appointed to the Protect Michigan Commission, which um, Dr. Caldoun leads, and a lot of communication work is going on at that level that will help us statewide, really about everything from encouraging people to get vaccinating to dealing with the different communication messages around, you know, eligibility and, you know, all of, you know, all of the different things that everybody's so confused about. Um, and really interlacing then with the racial equity um, task force that Lieutenant Governor Garland is also um, chairing. So those two things really go hand in hand. And so, you know, at the level of our community, what we have to do is like we have a, a zip code that um, we had a huge outbreak, um, that outbreak in, in a zip code, which was odd. I mean, you don't, normally you have outbreaks in, in a facility. This was an outbreak literally in a zip code. Um, and it was tied to some particularly vulnerable people in our community. And that was by race, that was by, um, you know, nation of origin. It was, it was a number of different things, crowded multi-generational housing, um, some cultural components, things like that. So we put, a cl we put clinics, you know, other than our mass vaccination clinic, right in those neighborhoods sometimes. So, or you go right to there. say low income senior housing complexes in, in those neighborhoods. Um, so you've got strike teams, you've got pop-up clinics, you've got another clinic going on. And all the time, you do have to be doing this very highly efficient operation. So, you know, we also partner with CATA as well as RSVP to give people rides to wherever we are. So a free ride is available in this county and actually in the, the tri-county area to anywhere where you have a scheduled appointment for a vaccine. Whoever it is who, however we distribute these, the goal is to get to at least 70% vaccination of everyone 16 and up in Michigan. That's a lot of folks. Even if we get there to that 70% goal, herd immunity is not guaranteed. So you can probably, know, you probably know where I'm going with this and you've answered it a hundred times, I'm sure, but when do we get back to some sense of normal? Either one of you. I, you know, I think, I think 70% and I think Dr. Caldoun would agree 70% um, is probably a, you know, this is our, this is our first target. I think once we get to that first target, it's going to be like, then we want to get to 75 and then we want to get to 80. I think most of us would agree that we need to get above that 70%. Um, so that's going to be important, but we also don't want to set a bar that just seems so overwhelming for everybody because we know we've got some people to kind of move along at the same time. So when do we get to, to a sense of normal? I think Dr. Fauci has said maybe by the end of the year, certainly the summer will be a little bit better. Um, if we do get vaccine, as um, the, the federal government is saying now, you know, there will be enough available by July is what I've heard for pretty much everybody who's eligible to get a vaccine. Now, we've heard promises about dates before, um, so we'll have to see. But if we get that vaccine available, I mean, I, I was the EPC, Emergency Preparedness Coordinator in Kalamazoo when, when I first stepped into public health. And we were working on the basis that there was a credible threat for a smallpox release in the United States, bioterrorism event. And so we prepared to va vaccinate with smallpox vaccine, which is also very difficult to manage. Our entire communities, our plans, according to the federal government requirements of these plans and the funding, had to be written so that we could vaccinate our entire community in three days. So we have plans that do that. Now, I will tell you, do I think that we actually could have done it in three days? Probably not. Um, that was probably a little optimistic. The plan on paper you know, accomplishes it, but in reality, could we do it in two weeks or a month? We absolutely could. We could absolutely get everyone vaccinated with enough supply in, in a very short period of time. And then we would achieve herd immunity, so. Yeah, I, I, I I'll, guess I'm, go, go ahead. ahead. No, I'll just add to that. Uh, Linda's absolutely right. The 70% the of people 16 and up uh, is actually not the, the herd immunity uh, number necessarily. We, we would probably have to see a, a, a lot more. We said 16 because quite frankly, right now that's the eligibility group for the vaccines that are on the market. If we see vaccines that were children, where you know, children are authorized to, to have it administered to them, we may change. 
The other thing to be concerned about are these variants. Uh, these variants, the B117 has been identified more than 300 cases in the state of Michigan. Uh, there are probably more we have not yet identified. Those are more easily transmitted and therefore we will likely need even more people to be immune, uh, ideally through vaccination, of course, to be able to get to herd immunity. Now, I guess I'm, I'm being a little self-serving and asking when we'll get back to normalcy because I just need to know when to clean my house so I can have guests over again. Um, there, moving on to one of the things that's come up quite a bit um, in some of our writing and, and we've had questions from readers is why has the whole distribution been more, um, uh, it's been more localized versus a central uh, centralized distribution. And I understand of course that, you know, the, that the state is figuring out where to send the, the, the vaccines, but it does feel a little haphazard for for some of us just because it is localized. Um, tell me a little bit about why it is more local control, I guess, here. Well, that's the way the public health system in the state of Michigan is organized. So okay. the, the state health department is not a, um, a provider, a vaccinator, you know, that's why we gave Dr. Dr. Caldoun and the governor their flu shots. I was like, oh, can't you do your own flu shots? Dr. Caldoun is like, no, we can't, you know? So uh, we are a local rural state, the state of Florida Every single health department in the state of Florida at the county level is actually part of the state health department. So you see differences in how public health is in any given state. So this is a, a local rural state, but that does also provide some advantages in that we have teams and armies of people kind of already situated all across the state to make this happen. And I'll also add... If I can, if I can add there, we do at the state level still provide high level strategy guidance direction. We're determining what phase we're in. We're determining how much goes where. So there is actually a, a centralized role and, and function there. Data, all of those things are, are centralized. But I also think there's there's value in having entities who are these local health offices are amazing. They understand their communities. They've already got partnerships in their communities. When I was the chief medical officer in Baltimore and when I led Detroit's health department, it was the same way. When we responded to hepatitis A, we knew where people were. We would go to the corner with our van, really trusted members of the community. And that's really the benefit of having uh, local health officials and local health departments. They understand the community. Having someone who sits in Lansing know what's happening, you know, in, in you know, the Western Upper Peninsula, it, it's really not even, I think, practicable. We really need those local health officers to help guide strategy in the state. A lot of sense. The local health officers, of course, know who are the best partners in that community, in those counties, in those communities to help them out with, with outreach and, and with mechanics of distribution. So I get that. Is, you know, speaking of data, um, one of, we've been writing a lot about the um, trying to connect, the state has been trying to connect a lot of electronic medical record data to the vaccination database. To get, the, to, to get an understanding of how we're distributing the, the vaccine in terms of, you know, again, going back to that racial equity question. So again, you had a, an immunization database that didn't collect race data. And then now you're trying to collect all these electronic medical records, stitch it all together to get this picture. Why wasn't that done beforehand? Or talk to me a little bit about the complications of that, Dr. Keldon. Absolutely, and, and I do want to clarify, um, as far as the electronic medical records at hospitals connecting to our immunization registry, that actually is something that we did before the vaccines came, were, were even available. So I, I think that's not quite uh, accurate. That electronic system um, does work. It was not there previously, uh, but we built it out in preparation for the vaccine. Uh, the challenges that we're having with the data is that, quite frankly, at the point of service, uh, where people are literally getting the shot put in the arm, they are often not uh, telling their providers that the uh, their race or ethnicity because they're, they're choosing not to. And then there are some challenges with our providers uh, for whatever reason, um, who sometimes are not putting that information into their systems, um, even if they have been told it by, by the, the person. Um, the other thing that, which I think is what you're probably getting at, manually, the manual process for entities to be able to put that information into our system on the back end, that is something that we have built out more recently, even, even last week, to try to um, 
encourage or get more individuals to be able to put that information in on the back end. And Linda can tell you this, a lot of the work is going on in the neighborhood. So it's not uh, necessarily the health systems. They have to go back and look at spreadsheets and whatnot sometimes. And so sometimes it's hard to get that uh, instant electronic feed. Uh, and I also think there's, there's um, the other thing that we're working on is basically getting older birth certificates. Uh, so electronically at the state, we have birth certificates and we can match that data, but we're now going back and looking at birth certificates from before 1987 uh, and manually going to be trying to cross match that with our vaccination data. I can imagine that's a big, big job. I guess it's surprising for the for for many of us that that stuff that that, that information isn't already there. But I can see that you really are pulling it from lots of different places. Mm -hmm. How do you, Linda? Let me ask you this one: um, the variants that we've been talking about, Dr. Caldoun, you mentioned them earlier. We're up to more than three hundred. I think it was three more than three hundred of the one variant, the B one one seven. But we have these other variants that are threatening too. How does that change modeling or predictions for the future? And if you could talk a little bit about the variants and why they are so worrisome. Well, um, first of all, to some degree, the variants were predictable. So this is an RNA virus, it's not a DNA virus. So I'm gonna get all molecular biologist on you for a minute and explain to you that when DNA synthesizes, it's DNA polymerase has an error proofing thing in it. So it goes fixes, it fixes its errors. RNA viruses don't do that, which is why we have to get a new flu vaccine every year. Coronavirus though, an RNA virus does have kind of a backdoor, but less efficient error proofing capability. So it just doesn't work very well. So anytime you see an RNA virus come along, you can expect that you're going to get what we call a drift. And that's, you know, in flu, it's called a drift versus a shift. When it drifts, we can match it up with the vaccine. We can basically count on the vaccine that we have to continue to work with it. When it does a major shift, like it did with H1N1, then it potentially also becomes a pandemic. So um, to some extent, yes, we're concerned about variants. They're more transmissible. We have to keep track of what they're doing in order to guide us on how we continue to um, you know, message to people about how to stay safe. Um, but in terms of being, you know, overly concerned about, oh my gosh, this virus is mutating, we're never going to get out of this. This is predictable for this kind of virus. We knew that when it first happened. And you've seen variants from the very beginning. So as they change just how they act, then we also have to change some, to some extent, how we message. Not really a lot what we do at this point in time. When you have a higher, higher transmissible um, virus, it just means we need to double down on the very things that we have seen work already. Look at our flu season right now. We are in the, his, the most historically low flu season we have seen. I have yet to see, it's like the little black line is just like, there's just like, we still have not seen widespread flu activity in this country, in this state, anywhere. Um, so those things work. The masks work. The social distance, excuse me, physical distancing works. The, you know, avoiding gatherings and those sorts of things work. The staying home when you're sick works. All those things we tell you every flu season, except we, you know, we've adopted masks at this time. Those things work and we're proving it right now with flu cases. It will continue to work with COVID. Um, we just have to make sure we don't let our guard down as we get through all of this. Story today on, or, or yesterday on that topic about flu, and it's amazing to look at, at the numbers. And usually this year, as a health writer, you know, I'm checking that that flu map, the United States flu map every day, and it's glowing red and orange everywhere. If you look at it now, and I've never seen this, it's all green, and it doesn't mean there's no flu. Certainly, there are flu cases, but it, I've I've never seen anything like this. Um, you know, let's let, let's just expand on that, elaborate a little bit on that too. It's not just about the things that we do individually, the masking and the social distance. I think there's a lot of systemic things we've put into place. And I, I think about the plexiglass that is everywhere on our errands now, the plexiglass at the post office, the plexiglass at the cashier, um, at the store cashier. I mean, it seems like there's a lot of systemic things that have taken place that are cutting down the flu too. Are there other, are there other respiratory illnesses or other, 
I, I don't know, um, things that we can expect, kind of good news from COVID and COVID has been just so miserable. The fact that it's compressed flu is great. Are there other, I guess, silver linings that you can think of in all of this? You know, one thing that I've been pleased with, again, the silver lining, I suppose, is I think everyone and, and every business, um, uh, health systems, I think everyone understands the role they can play in public health uh, and promoting the health of the entire community. And we've essentially, I hate to say it, but in some places, forced partnerships <laughs> and relationships to develop. And it's been great. And, and I hope that those things don't go away. I mean, local health departments and health systems speaking on a regular ba uh, basis, uh, health departments and businesses speaking about how to keep employees healthy. Those are wonderful things that, to be honest with you, before the pandemic, uh, public health professionals have been pleading and wanting these types of partnerships anyway. So I think it's really a silver lining in all of this. Yeah, we yeah, certainly have seen more When we talk about partnership cooperation, yeah, when we talk about partnerships in local public health, we're usually looking at our nonprofits and our community-based organizations and all that sort of thing. And and not necessarily every health officer in the state has this now, but I just had um, the president of my chamber of commerce come out to look at our site. And I told him, I said, you know, I don't think your typical health officer thinks of their chamber of commerce as a strong partner in this. And yet our regional chamber of commerce here has done a relaunch Greater Lansing um, when I started getting overwhelmed with businesses asking me, I, I have an employee that tested positive, what do I do? I gave messaging to my chamber of commerce and they answer those questions for me now. Because we all know how to count to 10 days of isolation, 14 days of quarantine, six feet, you know, all of those things, you know, that's not rocket science. And so that is something my chamber of commerce is doing for me with businesses right now. We've seen a lot of collaboration, even in, in normal for-profit uh, competitors in, in the healthcare world. Uh, we've heard that for the last year, just how much more often they're speaking to each other when, you know, kind of their default position is compete. And there have been a lot more discussions between them. So let me let me move back to the variants for a minute. Um, and I should have asked I should have asked you this earlier. But when we're speaking about the variants, we I see every day these different or you know every other day different studies on how effective the vaccines are against the variants. Um, I think Linda, this would be great for you since you've got this background in in, in immunology and your research there. Just generally, how effective are the vaccines that we have right now against these variants? What do we know? I think everything we've seen so far is that this vaccine continues to prove effective against the variants that we have seen. And so it really isn't about the vaccine failing to do the work that we need it to do to keep these variants in check. It's about all of the other things that we need to do to keep the variants in check while we get enough people vaccinated. So those two things have got to be, you know, on a, on a you know, parallel train track together. Um, and they, that's what gets us to that place where you say some semblance of normal. And there's no reason to expect that at this point in time anyway, from every variant we've seen, there's no reason to believe that we can't still get there with that. Um, but when you're talking about variants that are more highly transmissible, it does become even more important for people to realize, and, and people don't like to hear this. It's like, what do you mean? I got vaccinated, I still have to wear my mask, what's the point? It's like, we've got to get to herd immunity, that's what the point is. There's a highly transmissible variant um, while you are 95%, you know, unlikely to get COVID, you're also 5% could get COVID. And then if it's a highly transmissible variant and you're in a setting with a lot of other people who haven't been vaccinated yet, then we have a problem on our hand. And that's why these things have to go hand in hand for a while. We're not talking about them going hand in hand forever. We're just talking about them having to go hand in hand for a while till we get to that place where we have enough people vaccinated. And that's why it's important to do both. It's not a matter of, oh, well, if I have to keep doing these things, then what's the point of getting vaccinated? It's, there are not enough people around you vaccinated yet. And you have a slight chance of having COVID and transmitting COVID. And as small as that chance is, especially with a highly transmissible variant that poses a risk, 
of kicking off another chain of infections and you know the need to to restrict things and things like that no we don't none of us really want to go through that donate dr caldoon excuse me does not want to be you know working with um, um director hertel and you know working on orders that close things and keep things closed we're all trying to get back to where things are open it is not our desire for things to be closed but we've got to get there and we've got to get there carefully Vaccines, vaccines, vaccines. That's all we've been hearing for the last couple of, of months. So let me at, let me throw this out at you to both of you. Tell me about the, 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 the there's so many myths about vaccines. Dispel them now. What's what is one of the craziest things or the thing that you hear most and tell me why it's wrong. The vaccines are safe and effective. Um, they've been studied in well, I guess that's not the myth, that's that's the truth. <laughs> but they are safe, they are effective, they've been studied in tens of thousands of people. And even as we've, over the past couple of months, learned more, we continue, the studies are ongoing. And every person who gets a vaccine, um, if there is any adverse reaction, it's reported to the CDC and they continue to look at data. Still, to this day, evidence shows that these vaccines are safe and effective. Uh, they don't give you uh, the actual virus, again, their messenger RNA, uh, so they don't actually uh, change your own, the biology of your own cells, if you will. Um, so I think that those are the main myths that I, that I see or hear about. You know, we hear that it was done, it was done fast, and so it feels, you know, experimental. Um, I happened to be on a panel presentation with one of the formerly Operation Warp Speed um, folks, Marion, I forget her last name right now. Um, so, you know, I, I used to work for a drug company, uh, one of the ones that made, just made this vaccine. So, you know, I'm sure having been there at one point in time from a science level, it was an all hands on deck from the level of clinical trials and studies and dealing with the FDA. And there's a lot of complicated flying back and forth to Washington DC. You know, typically they probably did it via Zoom now to get all of that stuff done with the FDA. Um, some of this stuff was done on parallel paths, which put the companies that were we're, put it, we're, we're developing them at risk because it's like, I'm, I'm doing this and I'm doing this at the same time. Usually they go sequentially. Some of these have been on parallel paths. So production actually started before the vaccine got its emergency use authorization. That's a risk, but they took those risks. So that's how it got out there so fast is one of them. Um, you know, we're planting chips in anybody. That's just ridiculous. Um, you know, Dr. Caldoun spoke about the, um, you know, the, the effect uh, on your, your genome. I just, I'll go back to my molecular biology thing. What a virus does, it's a protein coat and a lipid coat and it's got RNA or DNA in it, that's it. It doesn't go anywhere on its own. It can't live on its own. It moves with you and it uses your cells to make more of it until you spew them out, it busts your cells open, you spew them out and then it affects somebody else. So that truly is a virus that injects its RNA into your cells does go into the nucleus of your cell, create all kinds of more copies of itself, repackage itself and bust open and come out. So all we did was take one little tiny piece of our mRNA and put it in and it basically um, does its messaging right there in the cytoplasm and, and then it's gone. So if we're, if we're not concerned about the virus itself changing our genome, we certainly shouldn't be concerned about the one little piece of RNA that's going in there. It's not even going into the nucleus. Um, so those are, those are probably a couple of the major ones I hear um, in terms of um, the myths of, of why the vaccine is, is not safe or, or effective. And it is both. The, um, what, what a, I was talking to a nursing home administrator here a week or so ago, and he was saying that um, they still only have about a 30% uptake among their staff for the vaccine. Most of the residents have taken the vaccine. I think all but one took the vaccine, but among staff, that was still a really low uptake. I, I guess two and a half months in, are either of you surprised? Now, granted, 30% isn't what we see everywhere, but are you surprised at just how reluctant or hesitant or questioning people are about this vaccine still? Is this a surprise? No, I, I, don't, I don't know if it's a, a surprise. I, I think it's important that we 
um, we not shame people when they when they have questions about the vaccine. I think it's really, really important. I take that, you know, as, as far as my responsibility, make sure we're getting information out there about the vaccines, even me participating in the panel today. If I can share more information about the vaccines, dispel myths, uh, have an opportunity to have uh, questions uh, asked and answered, I think that's what we have to do more of. And what we've seen is that I think often when people uh, see their colleague or their friend get the vaccine and they wait and see that, nothing's happened and you know they're, they're, they're now immune. I think more and more people are actually wanting to get uh, vaccinated. So while there are some people who still have questions and have not chosen yet to get the vaccine, I, I think we're making progress. I've said that a lot this year, this last 12 months. I mean, there's been a lot of shaming and, uh, and whoever doesn't agree with you, but a lot of times they're legitimate questions that people are asking very often they're legitimate questions. So I, I agree with you there. You know, speaking of, of vaccine reluctance and, and either of you, if, if you could speak to this, we've heard a lot about, you know, again, this goes back to that race equity issue about the need to um, reach out to minority populations and the hesitancy to take the vaccine. So kind of discern for me how much of it is lack of access or trouble reaching groups or just plain out, you know, hesitancy to take the vaccine. Why are those numbers still low among minority groups for vaccines? Maybe I'll, I'll jump in and say, when you speak specifically about black and brown communities in, the, in this country, there's just a history. It's part of American history, racism, um, people being mistreated. I mean, that's, that's part of our history. And there's a reason why many black and brown individuals are, are hesitant or have questions about the healthcare system. I mean, there have been studies, everyone's heard of Tuskegee at this point, but studies where uh, intentionally uh, people were uh, not given particular treatments uh, to see what happened. So there's mistrust. And even today in the healthcare system, there's bias uh, in the healthcare system. So I think there's some valid reasons for people to have uh, questions, which is why I said shaming people is, is not appropriate. I think that Hesitancy is part of it, but it's also about access and it's also about breaking down those barriers to what we spoke about earlier, bringing vaccine into neighborhoods, uh, using trusted uh, sources of information, community-based organizations, faith-based leaders. There's many vaccine clinics going on uh, with, with churches and others. I'm, I'm doing a town hall later today with many community leaders from, from very different uh, communities to talk about vaccines, to make sure people have information. So I think it's about both. It's about access and, and hesitancy. There are many black and brown people, I will say, right now that do want to get a vaccine. I think that's really important to note as well. Speaking of the, 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 the nursing home I, administrator I was talking to, um, it reminds me, we've done a lot of stories also about nursing home visitation. This is a really, really, really tough balance because we're trying to protect people from COVID, um, residents and staff from COVID, but we've heard a lot about, you know, the isolation in nursing homes. We've all heard this. Dr. Khaldun, can, can you speak to what's happening now at the state? Um, I still get emails every day from people who say, I can't get in, I need to see my loved one. Yeah, you're right. Um, it's, it's been an incredibly challenging year. We have always been committed to protecting our, our most vulnerable. Um, to be honest with you, that's why from a country level, we vaccinated people who are living in our long-term care facilities first, the people, the residents and the staff. So it's really, really important. But you're right, it's important to strike a, a balance uh, when people are elderly. So this that alone makes you more vulnerable and then you're living in a congregate setting that makes you more vulnerable to, to outbreaks and spread. You just have to be careful. I'll tell you, I'm pleased that our, our case rates have been coming down uh, in the state. Our test positivity has been coming down. As I mentioned earlier, over 40% of people over the age of 75, many of those people who do live in, in nursing homes have been vaccinated, even getting their, their second dose, many of them. So I think we, we are right now evaluating the current nursing home visitation policy, and we'll be discussing more about that in the upcoming days. Um, I'm looking at some of the questions that are just coming in from readers too. So let's tackle a couple of those. Um, any idea when the Johnson & Johnson vaccine will be available? I'm sure both of you watched the clinical trials and the, the Verbeck committee hearings or, or the decisions that come out of that. When will the Johnson & Johnson or any other vaccines be available to Michigan? And, and what does that mean? 
does it really help? I can take that, yeah. So really, really exciting. Uh, the FDA internal scientist uh, earlier this week, I'm forgetting if it was yesterday or the day before, but um, announced that they thought that the, the data that was shared by Johnson & Johnson showed that that vaccine, that one shot vaccine uh, was safe and effective. Tomorrow, um, an external advisory board group, I should say, will be looking at that data as well to make a determination and recommendation. And then the advisory committee on immunization practices will also be meeting over this, this upcoming weekend to uh, talk about if that vaccine is authorized, what particular populations it should be useful used in. And so if all things go well and the vaccine is authorized in the next few days, uh, then we should actually see that, that vaccine uh, in the state of Michigan next week, which is really, really that's soon. exciting. Mm -hmm. Wow, that's no, I mean, I'll remind you that they start production <laughs> as they're awaiting that, that um, process. And so that was indeed what happened with both Pfizer and Moderna. Um, we saw the FDA give the emergency use authorization and then the Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices met over the weekend. And then literally that next week, vaccines started coming out. I think that first person, I, I, I remember sitting through the, the meeting where they approved or they authorized or they recommended the authorization and within days, first vaccine in, in an arm here in Michigan. It was pretty amazing. I'd like to, I think as long as we're talking about the Johnson and Johnson vaccine and, and I'm, maybe Dr. Caldoun can tell me if I'm even right about this, you know, um, I think one of the things we hear about the Johnson and Johnson vaccine, and I think there is an importance to figure out, is there a particular population we should be targeting to, but you know, some, I guess, reluctance to get it because um, its efficacy seems lower than the others. Uh, keep in mind right. that the United States trial showed a little bit higher. Um, you know, measles, mumps, rebella, you know, 88% efficacy for mumps in that vaccine. But do we see mumps? No, we don't. That's why herd immunity also works. Part of it is the effectiveness of the vaccine and part of it is the people around you vaccinated. So in a sense, we could take these vaccines and dump them all into a mixing pot and mix them together because you know, amongst us, you know, we've got all of this different protection and even those lower levels of protection, once you've got enough people vaccinated, um, basically create that herd immunity. So nobody should, vaccines are two things. One, it's protecting you. Vaccines aren't just about protecting you though. We have people in this community, we have young children who can't get their measles, mumps, rubella vaccine because of certain you know, medical conditions they might have and things like that. We have a social responsibility to vaccinate around those people and create that herd immunity, which then protects them. So nobody should be really concerned about the effect, efficacy of that vaccine because we still get to that point of that herd immunity and everybody around you with a vaccine then also protects you. And so putting all that together, it does work. And I'll just add one thing to that actually. So if you look at the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, 28 days, so a month after that one shot dose, uh, it actually does provide pretty good, like over 95% uh, protection against hospitalizations and deaths due to COVID-19, which is a really, really obviously important outcome. Uh, so that's important to know about the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. So the message is don't be picky, basically. If you're offered the vaccine, don't be picky. Another question from one of our readers, and I've heard this from several people too, could you help um, us understand the, the, the folks with pre-existing conditions and comorbidities, not the 65 plus crowd, but the under 65, plus, uh, under 65 crowd, when, when do they start getting vaccinated and, and, and how do you make that work? I can tell you, if we can get more vaccines into the state, when we talked in the very beginning about not really knowing how much vaccine we're getting, uh, if I don't know how much vaccine I'm getting even next week, it's hard for me to make a determination about who's going to be eligible and when. We can make some projections based on what we are getting now, but I, I promise you that the amount's going to be different in three weeks, four weeks. Um, even if we talk about the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, I don't know. I know it's coming. I have no idea how much I'm getting. <laughs> so it's hard for me to understand. And I, again, I want to give clarity and tell people exact dates, um, but it's, we often just don't know. But I, I hope, I will say our goal is to expand eligibility as quickly as possible, particularly for our most vulnerable, those who have underlying medical conditions, people with disabilities, all of those individuals, I, I truly want to expand it as quickly as possible. It's just a matter of supply coming into the state. 
and just to be clear for readers, um, right now um, that you are not, if you are under 65 and unless you're a healthcare worker or uh, fit into some of these other groups, if it's just a comorbidity that you have, you are not eligible yet for the vaccine, correct? That is correct. Based on our, our, okay. our guidance, um, but there, our guidance is that based on the phase that we're in the amount of vaccine we're getting into this state, uh, it would be someone who's in some of these essential worker categories, so K-12 workers, uh, police, fire, um, uh, like you said, people who are working in, in homeless shelters, uh, people who are working in, in prisons and jails, or you're over age 65 at this point. But I do expect in the upcoming weeks, as we get more vaccine, we'll be able to expand eligibility. If I could wrap up with one question for both of you, if you could both jump in. Um, and Dr. Caldun, you appeared yesterday on a panel talking about this, just on <laughs> the pressure on public health folks in this last year. Some of the things that, you know, and it's, there's the demands on your time. Um, there are the policy decisions you have to make. Um, and then of course, there have been some not very nice things that have happened. And in fact, the estimate yesterday was that 190 public health leaders have stepped away from their job or been fired or retired this past year during the pandemic, 190 across the, the country. I mean, you're, you, you both have families, you both have other lives beyond what you're doing now. Tell me a little bit about how this last year has been. Neither uh, wants to jump in first. <laughs> uh, Jone already has her speech, uh, excuse me, Dr. Caldoun, I'm sorry, <laughs> has her speech ready from the John Hopkins things yesterday. Um, it, it is unrelenting. Um, it is overwhelming. Um, it's really just downright brutal, you know? Um, and it just, it's, it's never ending. It, I, it's every single day. And sometimes it's 12, 16, 18 hours a day. Um, and then on top of that, everybody's mad at you most of the time. Lots of people are mad at you and that doesn't help. It doesn't motivate you. Um, fortunately, we, you know, I think, I think we surround ourselves with a lot of supportive folks that do help us get through that. Um, I often refer to it as uh, I used to run marathons. Um, it's kind of like running a marathon, you know, everything in your head, everything in your body just says stop. And somehow you manage to keep going. And what is it that keeps you going? Um, you know, I, I have a very supportive community. I have a very supportive board of commissioners. I don't get questioned at least at that level on the decisions that I make. Um, so that, you know, that helps a lot, but, um, you know, I haven't seen my grandchildren very much. I didn't see them until actually this summer after it started was the first time I saw them. Um, uh, my social life is, you know, my partner is a musician. And so he goes out and plays live music and that hasn't been happening for a year. And as a result of that, you know, my friends tend to be those circle of people. And so I, you know, that, that has all gone away. Um, we are at home often working as well. I haven't seen a lot of my colleagues in a long time. And, um, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's like running a marathon at sprint pace, you know, you got to find some people to hand that baton off to, because really, about a 400 meter is the, the farthest you can go sprinting. That's why that four by 400 meter relay is like the, like the, the most exciting track event. So uh, every now and then we've got to pass that baton, but it has been, it's been quite a challenge. Um, and I think uh, unlike Dr. Caldoun, I think one of the reasons I'm able to keep going is I do have all that support. I do get to make the best decisions for the health of this community every day, no matter what, you know, threat or, or mean emails or hateful phone calls or, or whatever it is that I get, um, I, I get to keep doing that. And um, that's, not the tr that's not the case for everybody, which is why you see people retire, resign, get fired, um, those sorts of things. And that that can't be a very easy place to be in. Um, because I'm close enough to being able to retire, I think that if I were in a community that would not support me making the best decisions I know to make every day based on almost 40 years of experience between research and public health, um, I would continue to make them and I would take the risk of getting fired because um, I could pretty much retire anytime now anyway. So, so you know, there are a number of things for me anyway that allow me to keep going, but it has been um, unrelenting for sure. 
And I'll just That's add, do. yeah, yeah, you know, I, I did anchor my four by 400 <laughs> in, in high school and, and also ran cross country. And I'll tell you, uh, some of the things I learned from that, the, the mental uh, strength <laughs> from, from track and cross country, I absolutely am, am, have been using for the past year. Um, but, you know, I, I think I consider, you know, I, I have the opportunity to, to help guide the state through the pandemic of, of our lifetimes. I have the opportunity to work on the front lines as an emergency medicine physician. And it's, it's interesting, sometimes my patients recognize me and I, and I find it so humbling um, that they recognize me. I even had one individual tell me, I changed my mask because I saw your press conference and you said we need to wear a different type of mask. I mean, it's, it's really just gratifying. I know that the work we do is just so important that we are saving lives. We have saved, I don't know how many, countless tens of thousands of lives over the past uh, year. And I say we, it's not just about me and Linda, it's about we've got incredible teams underneath us. We've got Dr. Sarah Lyon Callow, our state epidemiologist. We talk about Bob Swanson, who's director of our vaccination program. Uh, there's Dr. Natasha Bagdasarian, or we have an infectious disease specialist who works at the state who's behind the scene guiding a lot of this. There are people in our Medicaid pro program, aging services. I mean, there are so many people, state government, local government, businesses, you name it, who are really, we're all in this together and, and trying to save lives. And, and I'm just grateful to be a part of the team. I think it's really, when I look back at this is going to be one of the greatest honors of my life. Yeah, I, 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 I. In addition to being unrelenting, it is also ironically quite rewarding at the same time. And it is definitely the flag, you know, the capstone um, of a career. It is definitely, um, uh, that's why, I, that's why I keep, we were talking earlier before this started, do you keep some of those emails and things it's like, well, yeah, because it kind of reminds me of what I went through along the way because um, I thought I would journal. <laughs> yeah, that didn't happen. So <laughs> it's, uh, it's, well, it is very rewarding work and just incredible teams of people. Good, and I think my biggest frustration today is we had a lot of great questions we couldn't get to. So, but I do thank you both. And I will tell both of you that I'm looking at the messages from folks and there are a whole lot of thanks to, to both of you for what you do. Um, I'm going to turn this back over to Catherine, uh, just saying thank you very much one more time. Thanks, Robin. Um, Dr. Khaldun, Linda, thank you so much. You both have 2 p.m. calls, so we will let you go. Thank you both so much for giving us your time today. We really appreciate it. Robin, thank you as well for helping lead this discussion. And thank you for all of the readers who joined us today and submitted questions and really helped uh, help us figure out what we needed to talk about. Um, as a reminder, we'll be posting the recording of this in Bridge in the next couple of days. And as always, I just want to remind you that Bridge Michigan is a nonprofit newsroom and we are supported by our readers. So thank you to all of you who are already Bridge members. For those of you who are, who are not, I invite you to help support our work. Um, and thank you so much, everyone, and have a great day. Take care.